Okay. Great. So captions are available. If there are other access needs that are uncovered, unfulfilled, you can DM me in the chat and we'll figure that out. Um, it looks like I know many of you all, but I will just say for those I don't know, I'm Katie Dichter. I am a faculty librarian at Central. Um, COSI stands for Conversations on Social Issues. This is a series that's been around at Central for, I think, coming up on 11 years. It's always been stewarded from the library and from librarians who came before me, Kelly McHenry and Kimberly Tate Malone. Um, we once again have a lively conversation coming up, up for you today. Um, something I've been really looking forward to. Uh, our speakers, well, it's going to be kind of a facilitated discussion. And today we have Dr. Donald Felder, Dr. Tanisha Brandon Felder, and Tracy Castro Gill, um, along with uh, Intamon partners Kiefer Harrington and Dante Felder. And I will turn it over to you all and um, hopefully, well, not hopefully, because we discussed it, uh, you all can give some context for the audience about the relationship of, of Central and Intamon and then um, go for it with the conversation that you have planned. Thank you so much for being here. Hello, my name is Dante Felder and I play many roles in the community and I love the, um, the big ideas around the new production around artists and artists role in, in um, society, what that means. And so today I'm coming to you as an as an artist, also um, working as an education director at, at Entamon. Um, also a father and son, my father's here. And I'm just really excited to be in the presence of greatness and also folks at the Seattle Central Community College. I actually had spent a number of years or a year at Seattle Central, my freshman year and I just told a number of your colleagues last week that this is where I learned learn to learn how to learn and so I've had a fond experience um, of yeah. Seattle Central and I am you know just love being in this in the space so thank you for having us uh, the, the Intamon partnership with Seattle Central and Kiefer can get into more details around like the weeds of it um, began about five years ago just like in a this big dream of like what if um, like what if there's a, a AA program that focuses on social justice and there's the technical experiences that could be had learned as well. So how do you parlay that that information of storytelling through lights and sound and, and sound design with the technical theater aspect that often is overlooked in high schools and middle schools and of course elementary. Um, so how do we partner that with that? And so we, there were some long discussions, arduous process. Yeah. Um, and then now there is a space for technical theater um, that's partnered or married with with social justice. Um, in, in um, I'm going to pass the baton to Kiefer to to finish it up, and then we can get started with the um, with the discussion, lively discussion. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dante. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Kiefer Harrington. I see him pronouns. Uh, I am the uh, Education Programs Manager at Intamon Theater, essentially Dante's number two. Um, and uh, Dante pretty much touched on uh, all the major points there. So, uh, you know, Intamon Theater, uh, we uh, are a company that's been around for, we'll actually be celebrating our 50th season next year, really exciting stuff. Um, and we are in partnership with Seattle Central College to be able to provide um, an AA uh, emphasis program in technical theater for social justice. Uh, this is a brand new program. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the students interning uh, on this current production that we have going on right now, the sign in Sydney Brewstein's window, um, this class will actually be uh, our first graduating class uh, in this program. So we're really excited for that. Excited to see them graduate this summer. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, you know, we're really excited to be able to uh, grow and expand this program and be able to, uh, you know, help uh, create a pathway mm -hmm. uh, for young uh, technical theater artists to be able to get into the industry and start working right away, being able to build uh, the skills and knowledge and experience they have um, you know, not just through, not just academically through Seattle Central College, but being able to uh, intern directly and apprentice directly with us over at Intamon Theater on our productions, um, as well as being able to provide them networking uh, opportunities to other venues and other companies around town uh, to be able to give them everything they need to be able to go out uh, into the working world right after graduation. Um, and, and start working or if they'd like to, um, you know, being in AADTA, 
uh, degree means that they that they have the head start to go on to a four year university should they, should they so choose. Um, so we're really excited to be in partnership with Seattle Central College, um, and we're really excited to be uh, putting on uh, our first of two shows uh, this season, the Sign in Sydney Brewstein's Window by Lorraine Hansberry, which. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, with doctors uh, Donald Felder and Dr. Tanisha Brandon Felder uh, and Tracy Castro Gill. I'll uh, hand it off back to Dante. Um, Tracy and Tanisha and Dr. Felder, Pops. Um, we're going to get into some real discussion. Um, there's going to be some, we, we've, I've had an opportunity to either work or partner, um, literally partner with Tanisha, um, but also just to work and really explore. Seattle in the Seattle public school setting and the many obstacles and barriers that have been put up to move us from move the needle with with our black and brown folks. Um, we've, we've had some um, Tracy and I have had some like spent two years working on ethnic studies curriculum and unit plan and black history for black history month, as well as the black lives matter um, week. And to, uh, Tracy can talk more about that process and also what Tracy is doing in a second. I also want to give a, doc, a big shout out to to Dr. Tanisha Felder, who's been doing the work for at, in the Shoreline District for what, 10 years, eight, eight, eight years, nine years, however long, and just been made a significant impact in that space as well. And Dr. Felder has been doing the work for close to 50 years now, if not longer. Um, in the either <laughs> in the Seattle Public Schools um, began as a principal and now is doing doing a lot of work in the community. So I'd like to just start off with with Tracy, my homie. Um, we spent again working with anti-racist curriculum, but also watching movies, bad movies such as Leprechaun in the Hood. We still need to actually put that on the on the, on the calendar. Uh, Tracy, um, who are you? Like, what what do you do? Thanks. Uh, Tracy Castro Gill, my pronouns are they, them. I am Chicanequis. And uh, currently, I'm the executive director and co founder of Washington Ethnic Studies. Now, we advocate for ethnic studies and anti racist education in K 12 in Washington State and beyond. Um, I'm a PhD candidate. I'm getting ready to defend my dissertation soon. Um, and my research is on the intersections of curriculum and the retention of educators of color in K-12. And before all that, I was shortly, briefly, an administrator in Seattle Public Schools. I was the Ethnic Studies Program Manager. And prior to that, I was a middle school teacher. Middle school kids are my people. I love middle schoolers. They're the best. Um, <laughs> and I'm also a parent. I have one child in Seattle Public Schools right now um, who is neurodivergent and queer, which has been an interesting experience in Seattle Public Schools. Um, and then I also have two adult children. My oldest just turned 30. And I have a grandchild who is 11, 12, maybe 12. Oh my gosh, I'm such a bad grandma. I don't know. He's he's old. That's all I know. It makes me feel old. <laughs> and can you talk uh, before we pass it on? Like you're the you said you're the ethnic studies of dot dot dot. Can you explain what the, what that is and what the mission is, what the purpose? Oh my gosh, of ethnic studies. That's a huge question. So <laughs> no, I'm talking about your your organization. Your organization. Yeah, we mostly do uh, professional development. I partner with Tanisha in Shoreline, um, and she has an ethnic studies cohort out there that we provide professional development for. But we also advocate at the state level. We're a 501c4 so that we can advocate politically. Um, we support anti-racist educators who are under attack. Our own ex uh, One of our board directors right now is currently a Black paraeducator who was fired unjustly. So that's one person that we're supporting right now. And he was fired during Black Lives Matter at School Week. And he's one of the originators of the Black Lives Matter at School movement. So <laughs> um, hopefully that'll be part of our discussion today. Um, so yeah, we're, we're really political advocacy and professional development. And um, we just received a grant to write curriculum too. So I'm super excited about that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Dr. Donald Felder, can you yes. please tell us who you are and what your contribu contributions are to um, 
society sps um i don't want to consume all that time so let me just share a little bit um first let me say that i, I got a sniffle so bear with me uh, <clears throat> i grew up here in seattle washington father son uh, grandparent uh, community advocate and and uh, an educator. Uh, this is, in fact, my 50th year uh, in education, uh, specifically doing something in Seattle Public Schools that typically references how we educate children so that all can thrive, not just some, but all. Uh, and now that we are talking about racism boldly, I'm really trying to figure out what that means to deconstruct it uh, <clears throat> and be able to deconstruct it in a way that we can then reconstruct a world where children know that they belong. Uh, that's kind of like my fortitude uh, <clears throat> in what I do today. Uh, my joy is actually uh, working with kindergartners and first graders. Um, so there are two schools, <clears throat> I should say, I've adopted five classrooms and an after school program. And the ideal is to create congruency between the classroom and what's happening in after school, particularly in these two areas, reading literacy. And I would also say uh, now that we're now formally talking about SEL or social emotional learning, being able to connect the dots to show that that when children love the environment and love learning, achievement will occur. So that the power of learning or loving, I should say, is often related to relationships. So I sit on a couple of committees and, and I sit on these committees like the Levy Oversight Committee, the King County uh, Youth, and I think it's called Youth and Children Commission Board. I do so because then I can understand the gap between what's happening in the classroom and what people say that they're going to do or what policy says should happen uh, so that I can begin to advocate for those children who are often become invisible in those classrooms and sometimes move themselves out in ways in which they stop learning frequently. So my goal is really to create some justice and you know people talk about social justice and that sort of thing so that's really what i'm trying to do this year and then i'll start thinking about what i'm gonna do next year which is give myself some freedom um that's that's the the dream the american dream freedom uh dr tanisha felder uh, good afternoon. So uh, my name is Dr. Tanisha Brandon Felder, and um, I don't know, I have like, I've kind of made three little buckets. I feel like this is a really good question, a big question. I'm excited to hear like all the connections that we have. I feel like um, I'm sitting in a room at my house, and Tracy has the cheese platter, and um, and Donald has like the drinks or whatever. Like I'm just like I'm very much comfortable right now in this space. Um, so my day job is director of equitable leadership, pedagogy, and family engagement in the Shoreline School District. But that's also, I think, my advocacy. Um, that is one way for sure that I feel like I give back to um, a larger community. Um, I was a classroom teacher for 16 years. I taught elementary and then I taught middle school. And I think one of the goals in my classroom was always to really think about what it meant to have a space um, for agents of change. And those agents of changes were like six years old and like eight year old and like then 13 year olds. Like, it didn't really matter how old they were because they had so much more, you know, intelligence and like movement and like the sense of like justice, I think, than any other adult in the building did. So that always inspired me. Um, I think I decided um, to move into a systemic kind of focus um, when I moved from Seattle School District into the Shoreline School District. And like things I think that 
have impacted um, for me, like my, the community touch or kind of like the impact, you know, um, I didn't really believe a lot in policy, I think until I had this position and I was able to start crafting it and making it become alive. Um, our race and equity policy feels like a real thing for us. Like it feels like there's actually some activity that goes with it. And um, the work that I'm getting to partner with with Tracy um, around Washington, Washington Ethic Days now is really about the the res, like the kind of idea of like here's our race and equity policy, but what do we do with it? Um, what about like you know ethnic studies? And students brought that to us, but we were able to kind of really work on an implementation plan. And one of the things that they insisted on is we're going to have ethnic studies, and our educators must be educated. Or they must be ready. And that's where that partnership with the work that Tracy does came in to help support um, what I'm doing. And we also have an anti-racism resolution, which I think is a struggle every single day to keep alive and keep real because there's so many powers against what you know anti-racism um, can be, especially right now. And so just working really hard to make that real. Um, but the other part I really love about what I do is I consult. I'm a, con I'm a consultant around anti-racist work. And the kind of the privilege I think I have with that is being able to choose organizations that align with the values that I have. Like there's freedom in being able to say, oh, here's an organization that wants to do the work and wants to partner with me around that work. And I feel like in that way, there's lots of ripples that go out from the work that I do that other people then get to create ripples for themselves. So it doesn't stay isolated. Um, I'm also a part of, um, I'm a board chair of Arts Corps, which is an arts integration nonprofit. Um, and they lead with social justice and anti-racism. And I'm a really huge um, believer and supporter of the arts. And I feel like um, having arts in the hand of our youth is like, I mean, power. And there's so many ways in which that can be, um, I think exemplified and like leverage. Like we have so much more work to like kind of let the art kind of lead us, I think. And so I really love that role. And I just became a board member of um, the um, Highliners Musical Theater Program, which takes, you know, that art form into musical theater and like allows our students to kind of explore and to express. Um, I hope that every single day, something I'm doing is like making an impact. Like that's kind of my goal is that there's, there's impact just by my being and really working intentionally towards being anti-racist every single day myself and being in company with other people who are doing that work too. I find a lot of power in that. Thank you. And I'm just thinking about um, legacy and impact and Lorraine Hansberry and her legacy and that impact she has had on um, the world. And in this particular play, there's the, the role of the artist and Tracy, this kind of like ties into like a lot of the discussions we had during our construction of the of the ethnic studies curriculum and framework around pedagogy, anti anti racist pedagogy. We always talked about and, and like deconstructed and criticized and explored and dreamed big about and just had these big dreams of um, like what would a amazing perfect curriculum look like. And one thing I always like threw in my, my artistic grenade was we need artwork and artists in there um, because that's part of the that's part of the expectation around pedagogy with with black and brown students is getting up moving around dancing and singing and celebrating their, their work not just the rote space to a rote memorization of, of content um, with Lorraine Hansberry she really think uh, explored the idea of like the artist's role and thinking about voice and identity. Um, Tracy, can you speak to like, like what is the artist's role in society? It could have been in the 1960s to Marvin Gaye, what's going on um, to like, what's what's happening now? Can you talk to, to us about like, what is the artist's role in society now as we go through this upheaval of Black Lives Matter and protests and everything else? Well, I always tell people if they're not including art in their ethnic studies, curriculum and practice, it's not ethnic studies. So <laughs> there's that. Um, oh my gosh. I think teaching itself, pedagogy itself is an art form and we teach it in our teacher preparation programs in an opposite way that it's this mechanical, you know, do this, then this, then that, right? And that's not what teaching should be. Teaching sh should be and is an art. Um, and educators are professionals and professionals mean creativity, right? Like we should bring that creativity into our space. I also think um, what we're trying to create in education has never been seen before in our country. And 
the artist's role is to envision what it could be. Uh, we don't have an example of, um, what do I wanna call it? Liberated education, except for maybe in small pockets, like small examples, but not on a systemic level, not on a statewide level, not on a national level. We don't have an idea of what that could look like so one of the, the techniques that I always like to bring up in my training is pedagogy of the oppressed and the different ways that we can literally reimagine different scenarios, right? By acting them out and playing with it and seeing what an outcome might look like that and, and coming up with things that we would never expect. And that's all through artistic expression. I think also, um, like you said, it's culturally responsive and sustainable to use artwork. I was criticized because I used Tupac in my classroom. Like one of my assessments was using uh, the Tupac song, the lyrics to the Tupac song changes that students could make um, text connections with both in their lives and in the readings that they had in their lessons. Um, and one, one administrator wasn't happy that I was using Tupac in my classroom. It was controversial. He was um a gang member about you know this and that but like my kids loved it and they did amazing work and amazing connections right um and so I think there's just so much there's so much vision vision in art and you know one of my favorite I, and y'all know this about me who know me I'm a huge Hamilton fan <laughs> And I know it catches a lot of crap because, you know, people will say um, it's still colonizers and you're glorifying colonizers and this and that. But I think one of the beautiful things is reimagining, like it provides a space for us to one, see ourselves in the narrative where we don't usually get to see ourselves. And two, imagine what would be different if we were those people, if we were founding our country, right? And so that gets us thinking, it gets us, in, it um, primes us for those conversations. And we can still be critical of it, like I'm still critical of it, but the artistry in itself, the reimagining and the vision is, is I think where the change lies. Yep, um, thank you. And I just wanna say, keep your head up. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Felder, uh, to you, thinking about like the role and the power of like artists and voice and art, artists, because that's super broad, just like what Tracy was talking about. Like, what does that mean to you, like bringing voice to the community? <clears throat> you know, um, you know, I've always had this theory that uh, when we have community standing by the sides of educators, uh, the environment changes. Uh, it creates such a an emotional hook for children to uh, latch onto and then feel like I can so that they say I belong. And so when I think about when I think about being an artist, I'll never forget <clears throat> the moment uh, when I was working in, well, I was the principal of interagency, which is a school for children uh, who are part of the correctional system, children who are homeless, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes I've watched teachers really struggle with the art of teaching and note the word that I use, the art of teaching, until one day I met uh, Amy Ryder, I know I probably couldn't, probably shouldn't be using her name, but I am. And she was an artist. As a matter of fact, she, her profession was a professional clown. And so I brought her into the educational space. And all of those children who would not come to school on time, when they were under the watch of Amy and a teacher, a willing teacher, children start coming to school on time. What was also amazing is that children were willing to participate in what I want to call after school activities, extracurricular activities. What I also thought was amazing is to hear children say, what are we going to do next? Which meant that there was this level of curiosity 
that children were saying, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. That combination led me to believe that what lacks in education is the art of creativity in education. What I do know is that creativity is not in a particular box where you define it. It really comes from the soul of an individual. And so when I had this opportunity to go to a school up north, uh, they asked me to do a student assembly. And I did, a, I did my routine, I did this, I did that. I brought clowns, I collect clowns. And I uh, brought my Donald Duck and I brought other artifacts uh, to show the students at an assembly. The purpose was for children to work with their parents to identify artifacts that represented their culture, that represented something about identity, that represented something about what their ancestors used to do when before they got to America, and in essence became white. And what I thought was absolutely amazing was watching every teacher in the school teach something that was related to the three areas that I just named. What I thought was absolutely amazing how children in, in, in every classroom were anxious to present something about themselves. What I thought was absolutely amazing that I didn't see was how parents participated in the process. And what I really thought was amazing was how the educators proclaimed themselves to be such a, a, a vehicle for the spirit that existed in the whole school. So when, they, when I talk about the art that often is missing, uh, I think about it in relationship to that being the perfect tool to allow all children to feel like I'm able to be part of a group in which we know that some children got it and other children don't. But the art allows the leveling of the playing field. And I've seen that from children who are in corrections who hated school. And I now see it with the little babies who still love school. So the question is, is how do we help our administrators who make these decisions about budgets understand that, they're, that the achievement of their goals, their policies are related to art? How do we help those folks who make that decision? Because Unfortunately, people operate outside little boxes and the art is someplace outside the box. And part of our process is to bring, bring continuity between the arts and the achievement in math, reading, science, and all the other areas that allows children to thrive after they graduate from high school. So that's how I think about it. You know, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you that when I was at Cleveland High School, uh, I, out of 187 students that were in my class, I was ranked, I think, maybe like 10 from the bottom. But today, people call me doctor. And if you look at my report card, you would see that I, there was, I used to thrive in the arts. I didn't know I could sing so well when I looked back at that artifact of a report card and saw that I got an A. So it says something about where my spirit was and says something about education because in public education, they didn't attach me to my love and to my gifts to do math, to do reading and to do the other subjects. It's unfortunate that I had to get to 
to college. And the only reason I got into college is because of the civil rights movement, really, quite frankly. Because who would take somebody with who was a low performer in math, language arts, and, and all those other core subject areas? Who would take somebody like me? And so that's why I continuously think about how racism creates this division where some get it and some don't. And so that's a scarcity process. And what we have to do is break out of that scarcity mentality and help one see that it's the work with community, it's these interdisciplinary intersections that we create by which all children thrive because it's really all about the children because we're going to be gone one day and it's the children who will be running this show. And hopefully what we're able to do is help them create a better world. Thank you. I was just thinking like the image of test scores, how third and fourth grade test scores are, are indicators of how many prisons need to be built. And thinking about that big concept of who is getting, exploring and finding out who they are, their identity, and those who are being denied their fullest selves because of the of our academic barriers that we that we create. So thank you for bringing, touching on that, Dr. Tanisha Fetter. Um, I think every time I think about um, the impact of art, it, it takes me back to when we had. Um, our artists and residents as we were piloting a program called the Creative Schools Initiative. And um, I was lucky enough to have an artist named Nate Hearth come into my classroom. And the idea was to integrate arts with um, humanities. So really blending it with social studies and with language arts. And um, I had a class that, you know, was kind of all over the place as far as like what their um, academic um levels were and just kind of their interest in school in general but they were always there like they were always present they were always you know eager to be present and um but what I saw when the arts became a place for them to be able to be expressive and to also use those arts as a way to show like here's here's what I'm learning in language arts here's what I'm learning in history here's how it comes here's how it shows out like there were so many different ways that that could that could happen like the different ways in which intelligence showed itself was just really um I think it was an important moment for me. Like it, it shifted for me the impact that arts could have from just being, you know, this kind of general arts to really arts is like a, a motivator, a tool, a gift, like all the things that um, make it possible. But then I think about every really strong movement we've ever had in this country around, you know, fighting oppression and doing resistance work. And it always has an artist attached to it. Like everything um, lives, breathes, you know, and kind of thrives in, in artistry. And whether it's songs or whether it's like, you know, posters or whether it's, you know, um, like plays, whatever it is, like there's always a message in there around what's possible. I love when Tracy talks about, you know, we haven't seen it yet because I think, you know, it's just, it's this art of like creating, we have to create it. And we are the ones that are creating it. We have the power to create that. Um, and we can't let people tell us, no, we can't do it. And so part of it is like the excitement and understanding that if we can envision it inside of here, then it can be a possibility, it can happen. And allowing our youth to really understand that the only only limitation, honestly, is sometimes the adults, right? Like if we get out the way and allow the adults, I mean, let the youth be able to thrive. Um, but I think like beyond that, just there's a value, I think a gift in what it means to really take in like the stories. Like my daughter just finished, um, portraying Mrs. Potts in Beauty and the Beast, you know, um, in like a 13 run um, show. And, you know, Angela Lansbury, you know, is the one who like, you know, kind of, you know, she started that role. And we look at Angela Lansbury and I love Angela Lansbury. So nothing against her, but she is, you know, she's an older whitish, you know, I mean, white British person. And you didn't really, we're not really have seen like, you know, a little black girl in that role. And to have my daughter on stage portraying someone, um, and this character and kind of embodying that, like that's that's a counter narrative, like that's a story and that there's power in that. Um, and I think that for me, what I kind of go to a lot is books. I read a lot and I've, I've been realizing that part of the power of reading so many books of different kinds of authors with different with different protagonists is to normalize the stories that don't get told to me all the time. Like I wanna have a normalization of what it means to see characters that people say are exceptional, just be like just regular characters having regular lives. 
And so the artistry of like, I think books and stories and movies and all of those um, allow our youth to normalize their existence, to normalize their identities in ways that I feel are powerful and beautiful and not diminishing or dismissive. Thank you. Um, it's interesting when you're speaking, I'll get to the, the next question in a second, but just thinking about Tracy, we again have these really interesting dialogues around ethnic studies and the power of it, but it's also the reality it's it's being threatened across the nation. And these big ideas around what Lorraine Hansberry has presented in the past, this new production and in, in now, that might be banned in Florida. And if it's banned in Florida, it can move to Mississippi. If it's mi Mississippi, you can start moving over to the West Coast. But so just thinking about like how the luxury of, of art, of what is that going to look like in states a year from now? What type of energy and, and productions can be presented to students? Um, Tracy, what are your thoughts on just like the, the danger of the political landscape for theater, film, and also um, content and curriculum? Oh, if we're talking about social justice, it's already here on the West Coast. Oh, that's true. That's true. Talk about those policies. <laughs> it's already here. Talk about those policies. <laughs> um, yeah, there's there's like a dozen or so bills in our current legislative session that would do exactly what you're talking about. And not just uh, preventing racial justice, preventing, you know, support and safety for our trans and queer students in schools. Um, removing supports and safety for our disabled students in schools. So uh, when we're talking about social justice, you know, we have to think about all of those intersections. Um, it's already here. They have bills and they have hearings. And um, if you want to check them out, you can go to our website and we have a bill tracker that you can click on. And all of the ones that are in red <laughs> are the ones that I'm talking about. Um, so it's already here. They're organizing. There's a, there's a whole group called Conservative Ladies of Washington. They're super organized and they would shut this down in a heartbeat, right? If they had enough collective power and then they're getting close to having enough. Like it's a, it's a credible threat at this point. Um, all of the right now public records requests and I'm sure Tanisha could talk about this too. Those are the thing. And even though we're a private organization, Washington Ethnic Studies now, we contract with public organizations. And so they keep us like all of our resources, our time and our energy are sucked up responding to these public records requests that these mostly white, very racist community members and, and parents are, are engaging in um, that really it's, it's a huge distraction from the work that we want to do, the work that we know will help our students. Um, so it's, it's a real threat here in Washington. It's happening now. Thank you. I just uh -huh. want to speak to that. Sorry, because like, because I mean, it's true, and we like we're, we've been kind of buried in public records requests since last spring, and it just keeps coming. And I think um, part of like my energy is like trying to get as many resources into our schools, into the kids of our, into the hands of our students um, as we can. Um, because I'm hoping, but I know like we're not that far from a lot of districts around us that have already been hit and like, you know, kind of like have that pressure put upon what they can and can't do. So the more like I'm kind of in this urgency of like, let's make sure that we're doing as much as we can until we can't. Um, and I don't want that can't to come like I'm trying to really fight that can't. But in the meantime, like that we have work to do, like we still have to get our educators ready to be able to like. Um, be confident and understand that we are unapologetic about the work that we're doing. We need students to really understand that the capacity of who they are, the, um, their identities, the affirmation, validation of who they are um, will continue and to continue to be aff affirmed. But we need materials where they can see themselves as well. And so I think the power for me um, is that the more people that are exposed and understand the power of ethnic say specifically, the more energy we have around making sure that that is still happening and working. Um, towards that. And yeah, I mean, I think it was like two years ago, I had a walk with our superintendent. And she was kind of like, you know, just letting me know, you know, things are coming, you know, things are ha coming and they are, they're coming. Um, but we're not there yet. And I'm going to keep working until, you know, until we don't, we can't work anymore. But even then we'll figure out another way. There's always like little sneaky moves. So. The other Dr. Felder, do you want to chime in about um, 
just the threat of losing part of our identity with great works such as Lorraine Hansberry and I'm talking to you, Dr. Don Donald Felder. I should probably get off the mute, huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's probably the secret. Um, so Tracy and and Tanisha, uh, appreciate your remarks. Because um, we do have a, you know, first, I, sometimes I say we have a long ways to go. Um, but I act as if there's urgency right now and i know that that what's currently in place is generations centuries of work so i don't believe i'm gonna be around when the change occurs but what i do believe is that i can plant some seeds for change and i'm hoping that the seeds that are planted are not just within the public educational system, but it extends itself to colleges as well. Um, I think that is a, a primary source for, for creating change and, and preparing teachers to teach creatively using the arts. I think colleges is a place for allowing teachers to understand as well as administrators to really understand the art of teaching, the art of relationships. Uh, sometimes I think we forget how important relationships are. And more importantly, I think that we have to truly be on the same page and doing an analysis of, of what racism really means in our schools and in the learning process. Um, I, I, you know, I've, you know, when I, when I've either led sessions about res, about racism, the feelings that come up most are, are guilt, shame, blame, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, without really having the analysis of that racism. I mean, I'm going to use a definition and then you can say whether or not it makes sense for you. But when I think about racism, I think about it in, in relationship to racial prejudice. I think about it in terms of having power to, having the power, systemic power to then employ those beliefs which then creates what I wanna call racism. And so when I think about that in terms of classroom, what I often see just visually, I see black children sitting in the back of the room or sides or the sides of the, of the room by walls. And where I see learning is often in the center of a classroom just based on the current structure that often is still in place and been in place for centuries, rows. Now think about that arrangement in regards to our community in the way that we learn. So I, I think about when I use the word deconstruct, and I'm saying that until we understand how we deconstruct, then if you think about all the periods where, you know, after slavery, and then we had 12 years of everybody saying, everybody gonna be, everybody gonna be a citizen. Then we had this oppressive period that lasted for, what was that, until 1954, something like that. And then that next period, call it reconstruction was civil rights. And now here we go back again. Now, so if you think about why does it continuously exist, it's because we never deconstructed. We had big ideas to clean up the mess, but we really didn't replace anything. So, you know, if it's like weeds, right? If you cut, if you cut the weed off above the soil, what's gonna happen? The weed's gonna grow back again. And that's what that's in my mind, that's how we still operate. 
So the question that I, you know, that I sometimes live with is how do we get to the root of our issues? And, and so that's why I say I'm in the classroom with, with, a te with one teacher and 20 children because that's where I see change happening. And hopefully based on what is learned, it starts to spread to one more classroom. And then if it's done right, maybe the whole school. And then maybe that school is modeled for a region of schools. And then at some point, the whole public school system will adopt what we know is right. That's what I'm really hoping for. And so I'll go back to this theory that until we realize that community must live by the sides of educators, we will not see improvement. Teachers just can't do everything, just can't. And I don't know why we expect it. To teach is an art. Therefore, let's treat it like that. Thank you. To teach is, is an art, so let's treat it like that. So that means budgeting, that means to eat those values, the whole, the whole package. So thank you, Dr. Felder, both Dr. Felders. Thank you, um, Dr. Gill. I know this is knocking, so I'm gonna call you Dr. Gill. Um, in 30 seconds or less, this is the last question. Just thinking about the director set set this this play um, now, even though that was written 40, 30 years, 40 years ago. Thinking about like the the why and the exploration of has the needle moved at all for that social walk and talk? I do see a lot of white folks with Black Lives Matter signs. So have we start with Tracy and 30 seconds left, have we moved the needle? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would say we've moved the needle on what we're allowed to talk about. I would say we have not moved the needle and have actually, I, sometimes I think talking about it has made it worse because we talk about it and we give the illusion that we're doing something about it when behind the scenes things are actually getting worse. So the the talking the talk masks the not walking the walk. I'm just saying we've had a black pre president. <laughs> Almost all of the leaders of Seattle Public Schools are currently black and I feel like we're they're backsliding. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. That's Jay, um, Tracy's one jab for the for the day. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Uh, Dr. Felder, 30 seconds less. Boy, but Tracy, you <laughs> won't have me shaking my head for 30 seconds uh, because it's so true. Uh, and so they they're grow, they grew up in the culture. So that's and so why would we expect anything different? Right. Uh, but I, I would say that if you know, it's, it's a perspective. It depends on where you want to look. So if I look systemically, now nah, the needle ain't moving. If I looked within classrooms, I see needles moving. The the issue that uh, that I would really like to see is being able to identify the great work that is occurring to show that the needle is moving and then allowing that to be allowing that to bloom across the regions what great because there's some really great work happening it unfortunately we just don't know about it or many people don't know about it to know that it should be part of the infiltration of what should be happening in classrooms thank you um the other dr T uh, felder i think um it kind of goes like this and I feel like the needle moves to a point and the white supremacy gets in the way and it pushes it back down. And um, I think in a lot of like our own communities, our communities that are black and brown, indigenous, like thriving communities that know how to work um, in spite of, or, you know, anyway, 
Um, there's a lot of needles that are moving because we're creating that, like we're creating our own standards of what that looks like. Um, but if we're continuing to work in within a system that was not even designed for us to be in, like the needle's never going to be working in our favor. So I think a little bit and then like a little bounce back. I like to have, I like to have a little bit more leaning. Super Nintendo Sega Genesis, just random, random rhymes from your neighborhood friendly filter. Um, thank you all for, for joining. Um, please check out the play. There, we had some big grand grandiose um, discussion. The play is going to get into the nitty gritty. Uh, please check it out. Kiefer, do you have anything last words before we push off? Uh, no, I, I think uh, doctors Felder and Felder and uh, soon to be Dr. Gill uh, encapsulated everything beautifully. Thank you so much again for all your time today. Thank you so much again uh, to everyone for joining us for this conversation. Uh, we, we hope to see you at the Erickson Theater uh, between now and February 25th. Thank you all so much. Hopefully you saw, oh, and Dave says, love that Biggie tune, Dante. <laughs> Dave, always, always Dave Ellenwood librarian, <laughs> knowing the music. Okay, a final thing that I'll say on that is that Dave Allenwood, <laughs> Dave <laughs> Allenwood wrote a scholarly peer reviewed article and cited, was it Dr. Dre? Come on, Dave, tell us. Oh, um, no, it was, it was Public Enemy. Public Enemy, Public Enemy, love that. Okay, bringing it all around. And y'all go see this play, we get $5 tickets. Kiefer put a link in the chat and um, lots to think about. And I look forward to making connections between this COSI and the play. And thank you all so much. Thank you all. Have a brilliant day. Take care. Yeah, yes. Faculty, staff, employees, everybody at SEC gets the discount. Oh, good question, Kelly. Thank you. <laughs> $5 tickets for all. Thank yes. you. Thank you.